so good afternoon, everyone. I'll begin by introducing myself because I'm sure we have new fellows and uh, new researchers here today. I'm Bridget Laff and I'm director of the Robert Schumann Center and Villa Skifanoia is our, uh, our headquarters. It is a an enormous personal pleasure for me to welcome Alex uh, here today. I've known Alex for a very, very long time, since uh, 94, 95, when he was a student at the College of Europe. And it was just at the time there was the Lammers Schäuble paper, and I still remember the quality of the paper I got on differentiated <laughs> integration. And uh, as w that went on to be the foundation of your PhD yep. on the subject of the LSE and subsequently we actually co-taught a course uh, in Bruges and co-authored uh, once or twice uh, but we haven't met in quite a long time uh, and in the meantime Alex has had a, an extraordinary political career as Minister for European Affairs Minister for Finance, Minister for Foreign Affairs, and Prime Minister of Finland, and is now uh, with uh, the EIB in Luxembourg. Uh, Alex is someone who crosses the academic and the world of practice seamlessly, has always retained an interest in uh, scholarship, but also in the world and how it, uh, how it works. Uh, and it is, um, it's Really a pleasure to welcome you to the EUI. Uh, as I said, it's a long time since we've met. Uh, and uh, your talk is on Europe in the new world. I see that the dis of the disorder is in brackets. Uh, I suspect we don't need the brackets. Uh, it is a world of disorder uh, as, our, uh, as the multilateral structures are under extraordinary, uh, extraordinary a lot of pressure. So welcome, we look forward to hearing you and we'll have time for questions and answers afterwards. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. I, is it okay if I stand? I think it's always a little bit, little bit easier uh, to get contact and uh, stay awake myself. It, it's really nice to see you and it, it, it's a great honor to be here. Actually, the last time I was here was in 2001 when Helen Wallace, another one of my professors, uh, at the College of Europe in Bruges was uh, in Bridget's uh, current position. Uh, and uh, I still remember that weekend for many reasons fondly and also the time that I had with Bridget in, in, in the College of Europe in, in Bruges. Um, she actually taught a class on sort of national EU administration and then subsequently we became good friends and, and wrote a couple of chapters into books and, and uh, when she was sort of uh, toning down her work at Bruges, uh, we became co-professors or visiting professors and, and teaching a class. And, and those of you who have heard Bridget speak before, you, you will get a lot of the same phrases that she used already in 1994. Uh, you know, like the European Union, it's more than an international organization, less than a state. Uh, European, the European Union is constant crisis management. It's a crisis management union. Uh, these kinds of things, I, I, I've used them in politics, I've used them in academia uh, ever since. We haven't seen each other for a while, that's true, but uh, both of us are extremely active on Twitter. Uh, so I, I get a lot of my, the Irish view on Brexit uh, coming from, from Bridget's uh, uh, Twitter feed. Uh, I think it's always important before you begin to, I guess, uh, tell the audience what you stand for so that you don't get sort of scared. Um, uh, I'm a raving pro-European. Uh, I'm an international liberal. Uh, I'm a globalist. Um, I believe in international cooperation in European integration. And in many ways, uh, I'm probably as much in shock as, as many of you are uh, because of the events that we've seen in the past few years. The best way in which I can describe is that for me 2016 with Brexit uh, and the election of Donald Trump it's a little bit must be like a communist in the Soviet Union in 1991 you know <laughs> your whole world sort of collapses and you go, what the hell is going on uh, and that's why I wanted to uh, outline my talk today as, as, as Europe's role in this uh, new world of, of, of disorder. And the way in which I'm going to do it, if you allow me, in, in 30 minutes, uh, is to give you three points. Uh, 
and then after that uh, give you uh, some conclusions of a possible way forward and then we can use that uh, in our debate. I'm, I'm very structured in what I say so if you like me have a fetish of taking notes it's going to be very easy because I'll have my three points and under every three points I have three points uh, again. Uh, so, so you know just call me Cartesian and, and, and it's quite easy. I, I, I was going to try to be really modern like my um, 15 and 18 year old and, and look at them from here but it would have been a bit cheap because all I've done is to take a picture of the notes that I, <laughs> I've taken for the talk so it would look high tech. I'll, I'll tweet these afterwards so you can get a picture. And, and my three points then, then today is to give you first uh, three dates and ideologies which I think have defined us in the West and especially the European Union and the new world of disorder that we live in. After that, I will give you three consequences uh, of the year 2016 as I see it. Um, and after that, my third point will be to give you three challenges or considerations what the EU needs to look at. And my conclusions will then be um, a set of recommendations. I won't reveal the number uh, that I would give to the next commission that, that starts in, in, in November. So first, point number one is, is uh, three dates and three ideologies that have defined uh, who and what we are uh, today. Uh, the three dates are 1945, uh, 1989 uh, and 2016. Uh, and the three ideologies are fascism, communism and liberalism. And my argument is that 1945 witnessed the death of fascism 1989 witnessed the death of communism and 2016 I hope will not be seen in history as the beginning of the death uh, of the liberal world order of, or, or of uh, liberalism. So first 1945 um, we're all students of European affairs and the West. Uh, we saw at that time at the end uh, of World War II that authoritarian fascist regimes, be they um, in Italy or Germany or elsewhere, were fortunately defeated and the liberal world order won the day. Uh, at the time we didn't have too many democracies in the world. We have a tendency to forget that. Democracy is a fairly new thing. If you go to the beginning of the 20th century, say 1905, we had a maximum, depending on how you count, between six to ten democracies. Nowadays, fortunately, we have about half of the world's 200 nation states that could claim to be a democracy. But it was a defining moment uh, in, in world history. It was also the creation of a bipolar world uh, when you had two ideologies left from the dustbin uh, or the dust of, of, of World War II. One of them was communism, the Soviet Union and its allies. And the other one, of course, was liberalism or capitalism or democracy, whatever you want to call it, uh, the United States uh, and uh, its allies. It was also a world where uh, the United States became the guarantor of uh, European security, whether through NATO or the Marshall Plan or uh, supporting and sponsoring in many ways the European coal and steel community and then subsequently the European communities and, and the European Union. But it was also
story to the story of my life. Um, I grew up saying that I was straight. I said I'm a Christ child. I was given excitement. Where else would you do that? Uh, you as a young student are, are reading the New York Times trying to understand uh, you know, what the fall of the Berlin Wall means, uh, what the reuniting of East and West means, what uh, being sort of unshackled from uh, the, the authoritarian regimes uh, of, of the Soviet satellites means. And it was a fascinating time. It was also a time of hope. Uh, for many of us, you know, it was Nelson Mandela is freed, Václav Havel is out there. Um, Francis Fukuyama tells us that we are witnessing the end of history whereby everyone will convert to liberal democracy, social market economy and globalization and that we have won the final battle of ideologies. And now that we live in, I'm not saying non-ideological world, but where the ideological ideologies are a little bit fussy, it's, it's easy to see why we were so exciting, uh, excited at the time. And I, I say this date also because for me personally, it's defined everything that I've always been, whether in the academic world, taking Bridget's class in the, the Bruges, whether as a civil servant and diplomat negotiating the Amsterdam treaties, the Nice treaties, the convention, the Lisbon treaties, whether as a member of the European Parliament or, or then a government minister for, for eight years, or, or now as a banker don't really want to sort of banker um, at, at the EIB. Uh, so so it, was, it was this sort of belief that the best way of society and the way in which it's structured is three things. It is liberal democracy, social market economy, and globalization. And, and, and that was the sort of sense of hope that many of us had in, in 1989. What happened then was that we still continued on the multilateral Avenue, you know, GATT becomes WTO and, and uh, Eastern European and Central European countries are integrated into NATO, are integrated into the European Union. Uh, the Euro is born. There's a strong feeling of, of, of multilateralism and international institutions uh, as the best uh, form of governance. Also, it becomes a world which is not any more bipolar because one of the other superpowers withers away. Uh, and as someone who lives next to Russia, 1,340 kilometers of border, I belong to the hopefuls that said, yes, Russia is going to become an integral part of the international community and embrace international liberalism with Yeltsin first. Uh, and then we saw later on that that wasn't necessarily the case with the, with the current administration. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, we went to a unipolar world led by the United uh, States. First under... Uh, George W. Bush and then onwards with Bill Clinton, uh, sorry, with George Bush, then Bill Clinton, then George W. Bush, and later on, um, of course, Barack uh, Obama. Um, so it's been a good time to be a European and an international liberal for the past 20, 25 years. Uh, but here we come to my third date. Of course, I could have given you other dates than 2016. Uh, I could have given you 2001 with the attack on the Twin Towers, uh, just listening to George Bush's, W. Bush's account uh, of it actually on an audio book. I could have given you uh, Lehman Brothers or the war in Georgia, 2008, or I could have given you um, the financial crisis. I could have given you the asylum crisis. I could have given you Ukraine, 2014. I could have given you Putin's speech uh, in Munich, 2007. But, but I, I chose 2016 because for me, uh, the world order that we had post-World War II, it was very Anglo-Saxon. You know, uh, you had the US as the undisputed superpower and then on the flanks of it, a first colonial United Kingdom and then later on post-colonial United Kingdom and as a member of the European Union as well. But two things happened, of course, in 2016. The first one being at midsummer. Uh, the Brexit referendum, uh, and then the second one being the uh, election of, of, of Donald Trump in, in November 2016. And uh, the question that I'll pose today, is this the death of liberalism? 
Uh, is this the death of multipolarity? Uh, is this the beginning of an intergovernmental, transactional, uh, nationalistic uh, world or, or, or not? Uh, and that's where I want to sort of test you guys out as, as well. I think the jury is still out. We are in the new world of, and I, I really mean disorder, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I've never experienced foreign policy being determined by tweets sent by someone in the morning. Uh, it's coming from my diplomatic. It's very unpredictable. Perhaps we can look back at this time, you know, 15 years from now and, and try to make sense of what happened. But right now, I can't claim that uh, anyone has the correct answers. So my three dates and ideologies, uh, 1945, death of fascism, 1989, death of communism in 2016, hopefully not the death of liberalism. My second point today is to try to suss out then, um, you know, what are the consequences of 2016 uh, for us? How, how can we navigate in this new world of, of, of disorder? And when I talk about we, uh, I always make reference to, to the, the, the European Union. I'm a northerner, I'm getting a bit hot here, so it's used to a little colder, so um, now, here uh, I'd like to make uh, a claim that there are basically three consequences of, of, of 2016. The first consequence is that we are seeing an emergence of power vacuums. Because, of course, if the United States does not want to take the lead in the world anymore, uh, uh, power vacuums will emerge. And when power vacuums emerge, someone will fill them. So if you go America first, if you go protectionist, if you go trade war, if you go anti-multilateral institutions, um, not only climate institutions, you know, human rights institutions, international law, uh, you know, if you want to buy Greenland, you know, uh, you know so, so, so what, what I'm trying to say is that if you have this sort of America first, fairly colloquial, nationalistic approach to the world and, and, and you undermine NATO, you undermine in many ways world security and the institutions upon which it's founded, the United Nations as well, then it's very difficult to say that, you know, here we are to lead. And also, remember, the U.S. in many ways has been the beacon or the leader uh, of democratic development and actually democratic export as well, sometimes by force, at other times not. Uh, and the question, of course, is that, that, you know, can the U.S. do that anymore with its current uh, leadership? And, and, and my argument would be that not necessarily. So this means that power vacuums emerge. And there are many different areas where they emerge. One of them is in values. Remember, we have been, for better or for worse, a beacon of civilization in the world for the past 500 years. You can read Neil Ferguson's Civilization where he talks about why this happened, competition, uh, rule of law, consumerism, science, medicine. If you look at a lot of the big things that we've seen in the past 500 years, for one reason or other, they have been Western skewed. This is not to try to project some kind of superiority. It is just the fact that a lot of the things that happened, I don't need to talk about culture and civilization in Florence as a Finn. Uh, <laughs> But, I mean, it, it is from here. Uh, and, and, and the question is values. We have believed ever since John Locke, Second Civil Treatise of Government, life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, which then subsequently became life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the U.S. Declaration of Independence and, and then the Constitution. Uh, that who leads on that nowadays? Second power vacuum which emerges is on trade. Sounds a little bit mundane after the big value question, but world trade, who takes the lead on that? Do you remember what Xi Jinping did in January in Davos, 2017, two months after Trump had been elected? He came and stood on the world stage and said, we want free trade. We want to fight climate change. We believe in international institutions. Why? Because he saw that a power vacuum emerged and he thought, hmm, this is a great opportunity for us in China to fill that. A power vacuum of multilateralism. Uh, you know, who leads the World Bank? Well, yeah, I guess the Americans. How about the UN? How about NATO? 
G7, G20, WTO, COP. Who, who takes the lead on that multilateral? Is it the US or is it someone else? No one seems to be talking about the BRICS anymore. It's actually only about China. I'll come back to that in a second. Power vacuum on climate. Who feels that? Obama tried. Trump is not trying, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, and then finally, a power vacuum, for instance, on currencies. Will the dollar be the dominating currency in the world in the future, or will perhaps someone else try to fit that space? So first point, consequence number one, power vacuums. Consequence number two, I would argue that we have moved into a new world of, of geopolitics. And that's something that we in Europe sometimes have a little bit hard to understand because we've still, you know, we've been institutionalists, at least want to be institutionalists for the past uh, 60 uh, years. And yes, the EU is based, it's a political project, value-based project, but it's always used economic instruments to achieve that, that aim. Uh, and now suddenly we in Europe must understand that, hey, it's, you can't separate politics from economics anymore. You, you can't separate you know, security uh, from diplomacy uh, anymore. We are in a new geopolitical world where the rules of the game keep on changing all, all, all the time. I would argue, and one of the points that I try to make today is that in that game you have three big players. And they are the EU, potentially, the United States, uh, and uh, China. This geopolitical world is also very transactional. You know, the President of the United States wants to do deals. He sees it all as a big game in many ways, a transactional game. Uh, this new geopolitical world is also very national. A lot of people, a lot of countries in these types of situations are turning inward. I don't need to preach about that uh, here in uh, Italy. I don't need to preach about it in Poland. I actually don't need to preach about it in Finland, in Sweden, in the UK, in France. You know, any country you look at today, some people and some political movements are, are moving very inward and, and, and very national. Uh, and this geopolitical world, as I said, brings, I think, economic, economics and security uh, together. My final and, and, and third point um, of, of, of the consequences uh, in addition to the power vacuums and geopolitics is I do firmly believe that, that we are seeing now the emergence of three blocks, um, uh, which, as I said, are the EU, US and China. Uh, now, some of you might want to say that, well, why are you not mentioning Russia? Well, Russia obviously is a military power. There's no question about that. But still, if you look at the size, the scale, uh, of economy, of sphere of influence, uh, I would make an argument that, that these three are the ones that are going to be the defining uh, factor. And, and as an eternal optimist, I, I would say that this is kind of a Europe's moment. You know, it, uh, Europe should not miss this opportunity to truly be part of a, a bigger uh, geopolitical game. Now, my third and final point before the conclusion, uh, and, and uh, with the aim of trying to stick to my allotted time, is to give you three considerations or, or challenges for the European Union, which I throw out for, for, for discussion. Um, the first one is internal, the second one is external, and the third, third one is global. Now, internally, uh, I would argue that there's a strong attack on the basic values and foundations of the European Union. There are countries inside the European Union, governments inside the European Union, parties inside the European Union, opposition inside the European Union, which are questioning the basic fundamentals or foundations of what the European Union stands for. Uh, democracy, human rights, rule of law, fundamental rights, press freedom, uh, equality. You name it. They're questioning, is this the right form of governance? Do we like this? Uh, so there's an attack from inside, uh, if you will. Some people call this populism. To be honest, it depends on how you define populism. I, I think all democracy is by definition populistic, otherwise it wouldn't be uh, democratic. Uh, but 
you know, there are movements from the right, from the left, and from everywhere, which are questioning the current status uh, quo of the institutions. The second internal challenge, of course, is Brexit. We can talk about this ad infinitum, uh, exciting past two, three days again. Um, and I don't say this only because I'm married to a Brit uh, and my children have dual nationality, as has my wife, uh, by the way, nowadays especially. <laughs> uh, but, but, but it is in, in, in terms of, 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 of you know, tectonic shift in, in what the European Union is about. Paradoxically, by the way, there's only one country which has ever left the European Union. Do you know which one that is? It's Greenland. <laughs> so, so, you know, but perhaps Trump was smarter than him. <laughs> you, you never know. But, but now, of course, we have a big player uh, in the process of leaving. Uh, I can't give you an answer whether they're going to leave or not. I think the EU has played its cards very well so far uh, on this. Uh, and, and, and because at some stage it will always turn into a blame game. And at this particular moment, you know, the cradle of democracy, the United Kingdom, uh, the cradle of common sense and rationality has lost a little bit of its edge. And <laughs> it's trying to find its way out of, 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 of the crisis. But it's something that, you know, we have to deal with uh, every day. Here we come back to Bridget. It's, it's a crisis management organization. Um, and of course, the third internal challenge always uh, I would argue, is somehow linked to the economy. But I would perhaps make you know, a little bit more of the argument that it's, it's, it's about income distribution and about fairness. I, I come from a strong welfare state myself where the Gini coefficients are, are quite small. But if there's a sentiment and a feeling uh, that income equality persists, then I think we have a fundamental problem. So I've, I would make the, the argument that the European Union has been quite good and business has been quite good at increasing the size of the cake, but not necessarily very good at distributing that cake, or at least getting a feeling that that cake is distributed in a, in a fair way. And, and this is going to be the big question for all, actually, European member states on you know, how we do that um, in the future. So internal challenges, populism, Brexit, and, and the economy. External challenges, um, I mentioned three countries, the United States, uh, China, uh, and, and, and Russia, and, and how to manage those relationships. Uh, I will make uh, an argument in the end of how to do it with the US, but suffice it to say at this stage that we're dealing with a rather unpredictable close ally and partner. And those of you who might know me or, or have read my writings from before, I'm very much a transatlanticist. I, I believe in that relationship, and I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. But, but obviously, the current administration and president is a little bit challenging, uh, as, as we can see, and to, to put it diplomatically. And, and this relationship is, is, is going to be very important to nurture. Uh, China, and I, I wrote a few years back in 2016, I wrote the Financial Times column, which I rather provocatively uh, named for China, Europe is the new Africa. Uh, and the argument there was that much like the Chinese had been mining uh, African raw materials, they were now mining European IPOs, uh, European companies. Uh, and, and my argument was that we shouldn't have a knee-jerk protectionist reaction, but we should understand that the Belt and Road Initiative, which in and of itself is interesting and good worldwide, doesn't come up, doesn't come without strings attached. Uh, so we have to understand that the game of, of geopolitics and, and business and finance is, is very uh, intertwined and that we shouldn't be naive with this. And of course we have Russia, which uh, is probably the world champion at uh, distributing disinformation and, and hybrid and, and, and cyber warfare. And of course in today's world the line between war and peace is, is very blurred. We don't, we don't know where that line goes anymore. You know, whether it's meddling in elections, whether it's, you know, sending out pictures in the middle of different types of, of, of crisis in Europe, in Catalonia or, or, or elsewhere. Um, and, you know, also uh, links to gas uh, and, 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 and uh, energy security. So those are the external challenges that, that we have. And then we have, finally and thirdly, global challenges. I'll, I'll just throw them out here. One is climate and climate change. Uh, 
uh, sorry for dealing with it so shortly, it doesn't mean that I don't think it's one of the most important, if not the most important. Second one is, is, is technology and what you know, technology does to us or does not do to us. I'm a big student of artificial intelligence and robotization, more than happy to go into Q&A on that. And then finally, uh, my, my uh, third global challenge is, is multilateralism. Because remember that, that that is our strength in many ways. And now I'll come to my conclusion to, to have been able to stick to my allotted uh, 30 minutes. Um, I actually think this is Europe's moment. You know, call me an optimist, you know, tell me I'm s looking at the silver lining. But I think this really is a time for Europe to be able to come of age. Uh, and we have three options here. One is to turn inward. One is to do nothing. And one is to turn outward. And of course, I belong to the camp that believes that we should turn outward and, and, and take our role, whether it's in values, whether it's in trade, whether it's in multilateralism, whether it's in fighting climate change. Uh, whether we're able to do that, I, I, I really don't know. But it will probably mean that nation states and political leaders have to be less selfish than what they have been. And I can say this from experience. It, it's not very easy, you know. I'm an avid pro-European. Some people would say, you know, uh, modern federalist or, or whatever. Uh, I was finance minister in the middle of the worst euro crisis. Who did I have to defend? Who was my prerogative with at the time? Well, to be honest, it was with the Finnish taxpayer. That's why you saw a country like Finland pushing the austerity line, if you will. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's something that we, 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 we need to do. For the new commission, which, you know, I was in Brussels yesterday and the day before, uh, exciting times, you can imagine all the different rumors of the nominations and portfolios of commissioners and, and the rest of it. It's an exciting political time to be there. Uh, uh, I would give three policy recommendations. I, you can give a lot, but, but three main ones. Number one, I would take as my lead what I call strategic sovereignty. And I don't mean to sound, you know, academic or think tanky on this, but strategic sovereignty for me means that, that you take more responsibility and are more aware of the economy and finance. You know, do you start screening investments coming from the outside? Do you create a European CFIUS uh, type of an organization? How do you avoid protectionism, uh, you know, when, when, when you uh, do this? Uh, do you have a truly European pillar uh, in, in NATO? Uh, and also, uh, what do you do with technology? What do you do with the AI and robotization? Because that is going to be the thing that it will change three things. It will change the economy and the way in which we work. It will change politics, media, the way in which we communicate. And it will change science and actually the future of mankind as well. How do you deal with that? How do you take a leadership? Strategic sovereignty is my answer. Second, uh, what do you do? You defend values. I, I really firmly believe that everything starts from values. You know, everything. On the basis of values, we take our decisions. And if you start undermining those values, be they liberal democracy, social market economy or globalization as broader systems, or then be they freedom, human rights, fundamental rights, equality of rule of law, then you lose everything. I think the reason for a certain Western dominance in the past 500 years has been based through a pro slow progress of these values and also in the notion of, of rule of law. If we start gnawing at that, if we start questioning it, then I think we're going to be in trouble. So we must, as Europeans, defend the values which we believe in. Um, and then thirdly and finally, linked to this, I think we need to defend multilateralism. Um, you know, I, I sometimes feel like I'm a little bit out of touch or even old school on this. But I still actually believe that the international institutions that were created in one form or another uh, 
post-World War II, post-fascism, or then strengthened post-communism, have worked for, for all of us uh, and made it into a, a, a better, better world. And we need to understand that if these multilateral institutions are withered away, I think um, we're going to run into to, to, to deep trouble. So this is what I wanted to say in my allotted uh, half an hour, so that we have a good half an hour for, for questions and answers. So my first point was that there are three key dates, 1945 and fascism, 1989 and communism, and 2016 and liberalism. Secondly, uh, I wanted to make the case that these had three consequences. Number one was the emergence of power vacuums, Number two was the emergence of a new geopolitical world. And number three was a new power balance with three big players, the European Union, China, and the United States. And then finally, uh, number three, I wanted to give you three considerations or challenges for the EU. One of them uh, was internal, the second one was external, and the third one was global. And I hope by conclusion that the EU will focus on strategic sovereignty on defending values and on defending multilateralism. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for staying away. <laughs> uh, we now open to the floor, and as a courtesy to our speaker, if you would introduce yourself when you ask a question. Please. Thank you. This one. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, <laughs> Minister Stubb. Thank you very much for the talk. Alex, Alex, please. Alex. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, in terms of challenges, what about security challenges, migration, uh, and of course terrorism? And in terms of tools, just to push you a bit more on the tools, internally you mentioned the importance of uh, inequalities and doing something about the Gini coefficient in every state. But I feel that what's missing in the European Union is education and culture. And that's actually when the EC started, we said we had to start somewhere. We couldn't start with culture, let's start with neo-functionalism. Yeah. Um, but actually, I think that was a huge problem for Brexit because 80% of young people of, in the UK are mm. in favor of the EU, mm -hmm. but the older ones who were 50 weren't. So actually, education and culture is so important. So what do you propose there for tools? Sure. Uh, should I take th three questions at a time? Is that okay? Yes, or chance. And also, please challenge me as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm Vincenzo Grassi. I'm the Secretary General of the European University Institute. Uh, I would like uh, that you try to clarify some of your basic uh, uh, notion uh, in your presentation in order to better explain what happens in 2016, the, the possibility of that of a, a certain idea of uh, liberalism. Uh, first of all, I think uh, uh, there is a, a need, uh, academic but also political, to better clarify the relationship between multilateralism and globalization, mm -hmm. uh, which are not uh, the same thing. I think the reason multilateralism was so popular uh, in many areas of the Western world, and especially in Europe, uh, was the fact that, first of all, we were the main player in the multilateralism game. So the moment you have uh, Chinese, Indians, and others arriving and playing in the same field, uh, I mean, the sharing of uh, advantages becomes more complicated. Uh, but there was also uh, a, a very huge uh, belief in the fact that multilateralism set rules uh, for everybody, and so ensure a certain degree of protection for the weaker part of the population and make yeah. possible to have the social market economy working. When the globalization becomes too aggressive and so many uh, rules in social field, in environmental fields, becomes uh, easy to, to, to circumvent through the localization, etc., uh, you have a reaction in the, in the weakest part of population, even in the richest country, that refuse the idea of multilateralism and globalization alike. And I think this is a point that has not been correctly addressed by many uh, political uh, ruling classes in Europe. Uh, the third element of a contradiction 
uh, is the idea uh, that after, uh, after the, the death of, uh, of communism was very popular, that the uh, technological revolution, the information society, was automatically something uh, pushing the democracy. So mm -hmm. if you have a, a worldwide agora, every, everybody can contact everybody, so uh, yeah. we, we will be all open. And that uh, is totally untrue. Uh, I mean, the, the, the reality has shown the weakness of this theory. And you have today the paradox that through digital means, uh, the most uh, regressive uh, political ideology are carried. And this is very interesting, for example, to discover that in many uh, Western countries, uh, US, UK, but also Italy and other, you start to have a real, in, in, in the, in the uh, totally digital world, you have again very sharp territorial uh, separation. I mean, in the big cities, in United States, in UK, uh, in, uh, uh, in Italy, the majority of the people is still rather multilateralist, rather liberal, rather open, rather multicultural. But when you go in the small cities or in the countryside, yeah. where they use the same uh, technological tools, the reality is totally different. Yeah. And we'll take one more, please. And then we come back for another round. Hi there, my name is Sally. Therefore, I'm a policy leader fellow here. Uh, I was wondering if you can expand a bit on what you foresee those technological challenges to be. And uh, also related to that, the loss of values is a recurring theme in your presentation. And I was wondering if you, you don't see it uh, or what you think about the possibility of it being an opportunity for the EU to sort of embrace uh, other leanings, for example, the wave of you know populism that you yourself mentioned in the EU, and of course the leaning towards uh, conservatism in the US, whether it's an opportunity for the EU to then look at other sources of values beyond what we fundamentally familiar with. So, yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Thanks, and, and thanks for the the, the, the three questions. If, if I start unraveling them, perhaps from the two last ones, because to a certain extent, you know. They are linked. Um, the, the first question that is underlying in what you said, you know, what's the impact of technology on, on democracy and, and values? If I can begin by giving you a book recommendation, it's, it's called uh, People Versus Tech. I think it's James Bartlett is his name. And, and he gives a wonderful um, illustration by making reference to Kahneman and Tversky uh, slow uh, and fast, or fast and slow. You remember that there's a system one, which is really quick in our brain, you know, it's our emotion and, and the rest of it. And then there's system two, which is our slower thinking and contemplative. And the argument that he makes is that modern democracy through technological means, um, through social media uh, and regular media outlets, is system one. It's very quick. You know, quick referendum. You know, people say something on the internet and, 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 and they get slaughtered, which basically at the end of the day might lead to a certain impediment of freedom of speech. I mean, I'm scared shitless to make a really strong statement on, and not only because I'm a former PM, but I, I've been sort of fried so many times as a PM by putting something, and I'm not talking about, you know, Trump, but a normal person putting something which is a little bit uh, controversial, boom, the jury is out there and it kills you. Democracy is actually made for system two. It's slow, it churns legislation, it looks for compromise. You know, Rousseau, Locke, Descartes, and the rest of them, when they sort of imagined the, 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 found, the Federalist Papers, Hamilton, Jefferson, when they founded the democratic base, it was supposed to be slow and tough and shouting a little bit in part. Now it's, it's, it's too quick. And technology has been a part of that. So has technology been able to adapt to modern democracy? The answer is probably not. That's where we come to your, your second point. You're absolutely right. Do you remember, I don't know if you guys were like this, but I certainly was, the Arab Spring. 
Facebook, Twitter, you know, Ukraine, Maidan Square. Uh, with the development of technology, no one can stop the onslaught of freedom and, 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 and democracy. Same thing, China. The thought was that, you know, this way we can. So, have we moved toward digital democracies? I would make an argument that no, we haven't. Have we moved closer to digital dictatorships? I would argue that yes. And then you come into the question, even in the West, are we voluntarily, by giving up our data for commercial purposes to Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, are we undermining our own digital democracy with that? Because, of course, democracy nowadays is about data mining. Look how Trump won the elections. Did he win it by canvassing door to door? No. He did it by having an extremely efficient tech team looking at the algorithms where to canvass and campaign and came to the conclusion that he went to you know, states such as Pennsylvania where you never thought that, or Florida where you never thought that he would win. But he did. Brexit, was it won by canvassing door to door? No. Cambridge Analytica and others identified 10 million voters who were probably going to stay at home, but if pushed, nudged in the right direction, they'd go and do it. So the question is, has technology helped us in democracy? To a certain extent, it made, it made the world bigger, freer, and, and, and better, and the rest of it, but I'm not sure it has. Um, People versus Tech was one book you should read. The second one is um, Why Democracies Die. Forget the two Harvard professors who, who wrote them. Uh, but when you Google it, you'll find it quite quickly. The only problem with that book is it doesn't take technology as an example. It uses the old examples from, uh, of, of course, fascism and, and, and Hitler and, and it uses Mussolini and, and then it uses dictators in, 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 in South America and Latin America with the argument that actually tyrants don't always, are not always born through revolution. They can be born through you know, de democratic procedures as, as well. And of course, then he makes examples to today's world and, and, and today's leaders. The third one, in order for us better to understand when he talked about the countryside, which is J.D. Vance, Hillbilly Elegy, phenomenal. Um, a story of a guy who was born in the Appalachian Mountains and, and, and then actually makes it at the end of the day, but makes a very eloquent autobiographical argument for why uh, you know, a country like the United States would end up voting for, for, for someone like Trump. Um, and then the question, Sandra, S Sandra? Sa Sandy. Sandy. Sandy, uh, was, was on, on, on the tech challenges and, and, and values and opportunities. I, Challenge number one is going to be economy and work. Here, I don't belong to the category of people who think that 47% of current jobs will be abolished by 2030. I don't think Rye ever said that, actually. Uh, will be changed, yes. But here, the interesting thing is, it's not going to be a change that we lose a lot of blue-collar work. We're going to lose a lot of white-collar work. Uh, you know, lawyers. Uh, my wife is one, but uh, uh, you know, r rentgen or, or x-ray specialists, uh, market analysis, uh, those types of things. And, and the question is, how do we do the transition? I don't think people are going to be out of a job, but there will be a discrepancy between jobs. So you'll have high paid skilled jobs, and then you will have very low paid uh, skilled jobs. And, and this is going to be the big technology. How do we take care of this transition? Right now, actually, you know, does anyone know what the unemployment rate in Europe is? Six, six, six point three percent. One of the lowest ever. What's the employment rate in Europe? Seventy-three point four, highest one ever. Of the highest. So you know, uh, but but are people happy with what they do as a as a job? And are we able to take care of this, uh, you know, transition? Uh, the second one is going to be technological impact on democracy and how the way in which it works. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy already nowadays, huh? We don't know what's true anymore and what's not. Uh, so we have this vast of information, but how, how do we not control it, but how do we deal with it? Third one, I won't get even into it, but you know, the, the change in science and, and, and mankind, uh, 
you know, all you need to do is to read, for instance, Yuval Harari's uh, Homo Deus. Uh, you know, when you start bringing in technology to biology, uh, it, it's quite interesting what happens to us as uh, human beings. Uh, there was a final question um, on, on security, and uh, we, we talked about security and migration. I, I'd be very careful to, to combine security and immigration and terrorism. You know, they, they, they are, they're not part and parcel of the same thing. Uh, but of course, security is a feeling. Um, uh, I think the migration crisis was real, uh, and I lived through it as first as prime minister and then finance minister. Uh, it was probably the toughest political situation I've ever been in my, my, my life. And, and the reason was that people didn't feel secure. Uh, you know, when you have a few hundred thousand people walking, you know, on autobahns in Austria or, or, or you know, 35,000 asylum seekers rather than 3,500 asylum seekers per year uh, in a country like Finland, you know, you wonder, are we going to manage this? So that is something that needs to be definitely uh, contained. Uh, with your tools, education, culture, I, I, I fully agree it needs to be brought. I'll make a final point on this because you mentioned Brexit. I wonder if sometimes we've tried to be a little bit too rational with the European Union. You know, we talked about the European Union, it's about peace, stability and security, the internal market. Should the European Union be a little bit more emotional, you know, in the sense that we have a feeling for it? And funnily and paradoxically enough, where is the biggest European movement at the moment in the world or in Europe? The United Kingdom. <laughs> It, it, isn't, isn't, it, isn't it bizarre? I mean, you have millions of people out on the street defending the European Union. Why? Because it touched people in, in a fundamental way. So, hey, I don't want to leave the club. Perhaps that's something that we need to think about. Uh, now for another round. Yeah, two here. Thank you. And Philip. So, yeah. Good afternoon. I am Marco Colleoni. I'm a researcher at this What was your name, sorry? Marco Colleoni. Okay, Marco. I'm a researcher at this institute. So, um, first of all, thank you very much for your schematic presentation. Uh, <laughs> therefore, I have a, a schematic list of questions as well. And there will be three interrelated questions. Um, I, I will start by saying that we all agree that Europe should move outwards and create in order to play more in the international order. But don't you see the temptation by some heads of state uh, and to put like kind of their stamp and their country stamp on this move outwards. And don't you think that this might create a further nationalistic backlash in member states that are not that member state? And so in order to avoid this to be practical, what are the chances that Ms. von der Leyen proves, out, proves to be like politically stronger than the strongest president in the European Council? Thank you. And then just behind, Thank you. Um, my name is Philip. I'm a researcher at the Econ Department. Thank you, Alex, uh, for the very insightful uh, um, speech, talk you gave. I share your optimism that Europe steps up and seizes the day to um, assert itself uh, with or against the United States and China. But I'm wondering which chips does Europe really have to play in the great game, especially long term after China has mined us as you put it. So our armies are a joke, our intelligence services are second rate, our companies are less innovative and less profitable in the United States, skilled people make less money than they could in the US. I'm really wondering where do we have to focus our um, attention, where, where can we really improve ourselves and get an edge to really play the great game and win? Mm -hmm. uh, Philip, <laughs> and then we go back for another round. Thank you. Uh, I'm Philip Genschel, Professor of Political Science here at the Schumann Center. Now you tell us Europe should defend values. And that's a good thing, of course, who wouldn't want to defend values. But how much would you spend on this? How, mm. how costly could it be? And to help you answer the question, let me give you an example. You briefly talked about Finnish financial policy during the Eurozone crisis. And there your prime responsibility was to the Finnish voter and not to values. Now you could say, of course, accountability to the Finnish voter is a value in itself, and that might be true, but there are other vote, uh, values like solidarity, etc., etc., which apparently uh, ranked second 
So how costly how <coughs> can this policy be? Yeah. Okay, back to Alex now, and then we start again. Okay, good. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to be a little bit shorter than I was, was uh, earlier. Marco, the first question was on, you know, hesitation by political leaders, you know, will von der Leyen take the leadership? First of all, I mean, without this being overly political, I, I think the nomination package at the end of the day, once it was finally conceived, uh, was a good one. Uh, you know, for the first time in the history of the European Union, we have two very strong women at the helm of the EU, one in the ECB and the other one uh, president of the European Commission. Um, and of course, you know, von der Leyen, I don't know her personally, she's one of the few ones that I, our paths haven't really crossed over the years for one reason or another. But she's a very convinced European. Uh, she is multilinguistic. Uh, she knows her stuff. She's a good communicator. Uh, we'll see what she comes up with. Let's not put the hopes too high because that's always dangerous. You should always downplay and then overshoot because quite often we have high expectations and low outcome. I think that it's quite often the agenda that makes the president, not the president that makes the agenda. Whatever he or she outlines in the program now is going to be taken over by events. Uh, so, for instance, Juncker, uh, you know, I, I would give the Juncker Commission high marks. The reason being that they dealt with the euro crisis, very difficult, but they dealt with it. They dealt with the asylum crisis, very difficult, but they dealt with it. They dealt with Brexit still doing it, and they're dealing with the U.S. administration and, of course, the war in Ukraine. So, you know, uh, they're, they're doing quite well. Uh, and I, I think, you know, Ursula von der Leyen, she will be a breath of fresh air, and, and she'll actually do quite well. Uh, and it doesn't hurt that she has basically been, you know, handpicked by uh, the French president and the German chancellor. So, you know, I'm, again, optimistic. Of course, then in the German, you know, national debate, you get people complaining and whining. But it's always you can never be, you know, a master on your own turf. But uh, I think she'll do well. My uh, the second question came from Philip Number One, and, and uh, you know, what kind of chips do we have in the long term? I, I think you painted a very gloomy picture in the sense that ah, you know, we don't have companies and we don't have intelligence and we don't have the army and and and, and you know, uh, I. Yes and no. I've lived about a little bit less than half of my life uh, abroad, granted about 15, 18 years in Europe, but five, six years in, in the United States out of that. And I, I think one of the rules of thumb of a functioning society at any given point is, do you want to move there or not? And, you know, I pose the question, do people want to move to the United States at this particular moment? Well, yeah, to a certain extent. Do people want to move to China? Yeah, to a certain extent. Do people want to move to the European Union? Yeah. So I'm not, you know, overtly worried about it. I think our infrastructure is a hell of a lot better uh, than, than uh, in many places in the world. I think our companies, yes, in Fortune 500, top 20 tech companies, none of them are European. But nevertheless, you know, fairly strong. If you look at GDP per capita, not bad. Size of the economy is not bad. Functioning welfare states, not bad. Gini coefficient, not bad. You look at the top countries in the world, in any kind of world economic forum, whatever ranking you have, competitiveness, equality, environment, out of the top 10 countries, always at least eight from the European Union. Europe. We, we just have a tendency to put ourselves down. Armies... Mm, well, uh, you know, NATO doesn't get attacked only once, and that was, you know, the Twin Towers in, in, in the U.S. Um, in terms of intelligence, well, Britain is not going to leave our intelligence community. French intelligence ain't too bad either. So, do you know, I, I would give us probably a little bit more credit uh, than, than, than that. So, what, what chips do we have in the long term? We have the most functioning welfare states in the world. And again, I come back to... You know, what do people at the end of the day want? Do, 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 you know, do, do they get kicks out of globalism or globalization just because it's global? No. But they want to feel secure. They, they want to feel that there's a perspective. And why did people start moving in the Arab Spring? Why, why did immigration asylum take place? Because educated people did not see that they had a future where they were. And I don't see too many people leaving the European Union because they feel that they don't have a future. So, I'd, you know... I'd, I'd, I'd look at it a little bit more optimistically. And then, Philip, 
the euro crisis, it, it's the classic question, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, in other words, which comes first, uh, fiscal and budgetary responsibility uh, or solidarity? Um, is it a value to, in a democratic world where the funds are skewed through a fiscal taxation system uh, and the welfare state is sponsored by uh, traditional nation states, to stay true to, to, to that line? Or do you start bailing someone out and potentially create a moral hazard? I, I don't know. All I know is that, for me at least personally, the situation was, was very difficult. Um, in the sense that, well, not only because we were in government with the true Finns and I was the finance minister trying to bail out Greece for the third time, uh, but to try to make the argument that, that uh, you know, we need to show solidarity in this difficult situation when that situation had not been caused by me or Finnish taxpayers or Swedish taxpayers. Uh, I think we will move. I, I think that, you know, here I'm a functionalist, so internal market leads to common currency, common currency leads to uh, monetary union, monetary union leads to economic union, economic union might lead to fiscal union, step by step. Uh, but the problem that we had then was, of course, that it, it was a crisis and some bailing out needed to be done. And I do think that at the end of the day, even though it looked quite acrimonious, we survived. Remember all the doomsday economists, you know, the likes of Stiglitz and uh, the likes of, of, of Krugman and, and uh, uh, many others who were saying the euro is going to die, it's not going to survive, and austerity is crap. And uh, so, you know, Ireland is back on the market. Uh, you know, Spain never left the market. Portugal is back on the market. Cyprus, Greece. So, you know, the bottom line is that we survived. And I think it was a lesson. The nice thing is that an intergovernmental conference would never have given us the depth of fiscal uh, or monetary integration, banking union, fiscal compact, two-pack, six-pack uh, that, that we have now. Uh, but it was forced through the crisis. So again, it was a step in the integration uh, process, but very difficult. I, all I'm trying to say is that you, you have to understand that you, know, you have a responsibility um, as a democratically uh, elected executive to the people who elected you. And then you also have, as a democratically elected executive in the European Union, a responsibility to the other member states. And it's that balance that we're all trying to find. Unfortunately, we're able to do that. So next round, please. And then Adrian. Um, hello. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, it was very interesting. My name is uh, Adrian Bradley, and I'm a research associate to the Tomaso Parascio chair here, working on the transformation of global governance. Okay. And I wanted to ask, you defended multilateralism very strongly, which is great. But given the current blockages in multilateralism, what do you think about um, essentially coalitions of the willing or clubs uh, that, or informal non-treaty-based organizations to try to further uh, the provision of, public, of global public goods? So you mean like the likes of G7 and those uh, Yes, or uh, even more informal uh, networks such as uh, I was thinking of the... Um, um, the Green Alliance for the Alliance for Global for Green Global Finance or something by the um, so, the central banks and uh, yeah. the ECB and I think the EIB is in there as well. Yeah, those sorts of informal networks. Adrien. Adrien Eritier. I'm emeritus professor. Adrien Eritier. So it was Adrien and Adrien. This is getting confusing here. Huh? Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, I'm emeritus at the SBS department, a part-time professor at the Schumann Center. So what would you see, what kind of measures would you recommend uh, regarding the impact of technology on democratic processes? Because you draw this link very interestingly to Tversky and Kahneman, System 1 and System 2, in order to strengthen you know, the slow processes. What kind of measures do you see? On democracy or in general on technology? Yes. No, on democracy given that the technologies are there, right? Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Pep Torn. I'm the university librarian here at the UI. Um, I would like to go back to your first point, um, the dates that you have uh, chosen. Uh, 
And uh, know your opinion about um, about something related to the 2016. So I see something common uh, with the two first dates, so 1945 and uh, 1989, which is that um, the the um, the different uh, so those who were in, in the conflict uh, they claim to have won in the sense that uh, they we we. We bit fascism, yeah, and both sides. They said no, the liberal democracies and the communists. They said we 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 won. And in 1989, uh, it was also clear that the liberal democracy. They said okay, we fought against this model and we won. In 2016, what I see is that uh, liberal democracy, whatever it is, is fighting against something that you said is not liberal democracies. But they are not saying we are not. So we are, they are fighting against. Or liberal democracies, uh, free market is fighting against something that they don't say. No, we are against all these things. We are not against liberal democracy. We are not against free market. Except we, Putin. Except Putin, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Huh? And Orban and Erdogan. Well, but they are. But so I, I there, see what you're saying. Yeah. So they the, claim there is to be no democracies. Exactly. There is yeah. no a clear narrative behind. So it was very easy if you want, even if it was very yeah. difficult probably, but to say our narrative is clear. We are liberal democracies and you are fascists. Yeah. Or we are communists and you are fascists. It was very clear to say in 1989 we are liberal democracies and you are communists and we are not. Yeah. But today how can we build a narrative that is valid to explain what we are fighting against? Yeah. So we go back for those three and then we have a final round. I... Okay. Good. Uh, Adrian, first. Uh, glad that you're glad that I'm defending multilateralism as, as well. I, I still see it as, as you know the best form of international governance that 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 we can get. And I guess the the essence of your question is that you know are we moving or should we see this sort of coalition of the willing? Uh, you know, G7 is one of them. Green Alliance is another. I mean, it's a really tough question because I, I like alliances when they are non-nation based, pushing a movement. I mean, look, for example, I'll give an example. If Trump rejects climate change and suddenly U.S. states uh, start doing their own uh, environmental and climate legislation, I'm happy because then they show sort of a movement, of a bigger global movement. And in that sense, that's not traditional multilateralism. Um, if we can get similar kind of movements going on, which are non-state based, it's good. But then what if a non-state based movement is like, I don't know, Al-Qaeda or, uh, or something? You know, that, that's a network as, as, as well. So we'd have to define more closely what it is. If we still live in a world based on nation states, say hypothetically there are around 200 uh, of them, then these nation states need to be organized in one way or another. And I have not yet seen a better form of organization than fairly traditional international institutions, which at the end of the day are extremely cumbersome and tough and sometimes boring and it's nothing worse than, uh, you know, uh, Congress diplomacy when people are reading out three minute speeches on a paper and then the note takers are trying to understand what it is. I'll make one point which I didn't make earlier and I'm simplifying. If we have these three models, the US, China and Europe, the way in which they do things is, is different. Uh, and they obviously all call themselves democracies, right, to a certain extent. The US is very bipolar, very binary, Republicans, Democrats, right? So it's always a, a fight between the two, black and white. China is a one-party state regardless of what's going on in Hong Kong right now. It, it's, it's a one party, it's one nation, right? Uh, and led from the top. What is Europe? Europe is about compromise. It's multi, 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 whatever. It's multi-party, it's multi-country, cu uh, cultural, it's multi-country, you know. And what do we do? We, we churn out the decision. We, 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 we come up, you know, with GDPR or whatever services directive, after painstakingly being shouted at and screamed at, you're slow and you're awful and so on. But that's what we are. So you have three different systems. Europeans are damn good at compromise. Compromise is never pretty, but you know, really good at it at the end of the day. 
Uh, so hopefully we'll stick to that. I, I, I'm not a, I, I, Bridget knows that I wrote my PhD on differentiated integration and you know, core Europe and multi-speed Europe and variable geometry and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course I come from a small state so I've always liked multilateralism because that's where you get your voice heard rather than with big power and muscle. But this leads me to Adrienne's question about what kind of measures would you use with, with technology. I, I, I really don't know because the thing is that I'm not a big fan of, of, of referenda. And, and I think direct democracy has its limits. But we've now gone into a shouting match of direct democracy, uh, which basically means that you know, people want change and they want it now. And the best way to do it is on social media. And by God, if you say the wrong thing or, or make the wrong move, you get slaughtered out there. I, I'm, and I'm not sure that's the best way to deal with it because you and I in this room, you know, we're not going to start a fist fight if we disagree on something. But if we were on Twitter, it's like a constant fist fight. And then, of course, exacerbated by the behavior of some of our political leaders in, in, in today's world, where the sort of, how would I say, the, 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 the threshold for uh, uncivil behavior is beyond. So, so I don't know. I mean, you know, I like e-voting and the rest of it, but I would not go into a constant. I, I still like representative democracy. Uh, and, 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 but how do we do that with technology then? I, I, I really don't know. I, I think that's, it, it's worth studying. I hope someone is doing a PhD on that. Uh, then, uh, Pip Thorne, I, I think your point is, is, is good and valid. 1945, won against fascism. 1989, we beat uh, communism. I wonder whether... Now, of course, you get people like Bannon and Trump and others who say that, you know, we have defeated the old world order. But what did they defeat? I think it's more a question of, of, of values. So you have these sort of conservative, uh, old school values, a la Putin, uh, um, or illiberal democracy, as, as, as Orban uh, calls it, going back to old values you know, which quite often are homophobic, they're sexist, you know, I'm exaggerating, of course. Uh, you know, they don't believe in freedoms, fundamental rights, human rights, they question rule of law. The problem is that tyrannies actually emerge when an elected government uh, basically starts to go beyond its prerogatives of, a constitu of constitutional rights, when it starts questioning uh, uh, and painting oppositions into corners when it starts shooting down uh, press freedom. And believe me, you know, as a former prime minister, I got my share of shit. There's no question about it. And I, big time. But, but the truth is that I'd much rather take that shit and not criticize it and move on in life rather than starting stamping that crap down, no matter how bad it feels. Uh, and, and, and now we're in, you know, when Donald Trump is, is basically blaming the media, you know, we are on the limits, you know. Uh, this has been done before, and we have to be very careful that it doesn't happen. So you're, you're absolutely. I, I really like your question. Who did we beat in 20, or who who won in 2016? And that's why I said in the beginning, I think the jury is still out. I, I don't know. Thank you. Now we have three, one, two, and three, and closed. Okay. No more hands. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Philip. I'm a researcher from the economics department, and as a Finnish citizen, it was great to hear the three points again. <laughs> um, uh, my question is about expertise and values. Uh, is there a danger that experts tend to come from the same value circles, and thus we sort of forget to defend what the starting point is? I can see this a lot in economics, yeah. that we take assumptions and we forget that yeah. these map to some sort of values in the end. Thank you. Here and then at the back. I'm Kinaya. I'm a researcher here at the EOI. Um, my question is about the world order that you sketch. Um, because it's mostly a world order of states and strong leaders and doesn't necessarily include the private sector um, unless you're talking about technology. Um, so after a long phase of deregulation, marketization, privatization, I feel like you could also paint a totally private sector world order in which states matter much less. Uh, and especially as a sort of banker that you are, um, 
I'm particularly interested to hear your thoughts on the role of finance in this. Thank you. And, then and probably high tech as well, big tech. Yeah. And then we'll take four. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Federica and I'm a policy leader fellow here. Hi. Okay. Um, so thank you very much again for your presentation. And I wanted to go back to something that you said before about making Europe more emotional. Because you gave a specific example, which is the fact that now people in, in Great Britain are getting out on the street and demonstrating for staying in, the, in, in Europe, which is great. But then I ask myself, who are those people? Because um, I see those people as being basically us. So well-educated, international, Europeans. So, you know, this new kind of young generation that has experienced Europe. And there is this whole... Um, um, many people that have never actually experienced it. And I think that those are the people that we need to make Europe emotional for. Because for us, obviously, it's something emotional. Like, I feel Europe as my country, even though it's not a country. But still, there is my grandpa or my grandma that have never actually experienced Europe on, on them, their self. And you cannot make Europe emotional for them if they don't even know what Europe is. So my question is, how do you think that you can actually make Europe emotional for the people that actually vote and need it to be more emotional than it is right now? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Phil. Uh, Philippe Schmitter, a former professor here. I've used you in uh, my book, if you remember that. <laughs> in uh, uh, readings on the, on, on, uh, the European Union. It was uh, Schmidt, and who did he write it with? Um, late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, he wrote a joint academic article. Uh, please, can someone Google quickly? <laughs> Schmidt and... Google? We'll talk about it afterwards. Okay, go for it. In your formal presentation, mm -hmm. it, you did not mention a single time an institution which is or has been historically absolutely central to a liberal conception of democracy, namely Easy. political parties. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned one, two, you know, the number, but in my understanding of this disorder, much of it at the national and subnational level is rooted in a crisis of the political party as an institution. You need to have this intermediary that people identify with, the candidates that they nominate and eventually get elected have to be trusted. And all of the data we have is that the degree of identification with political parties and the trust in the people that even win elections, not to mention those who do not, has declined. Mm. Now, do you have a formula? Our there is this idea that the parties are over mm. and that somehow we need a post-party conception of liberal democracy or do we need a different conception of political parties? Where do they fit in this conception of a new political order? Yeah. Go first. Good. Can someone ask on Twitter from Brent Nelson what the article was? Because we did a reader, uh, reading some of the theory of practice of European integration or something like that. And, and we did four editions of it. And I think one of your texts was in editions number one and number two. This was a time when European studies was still really hot. You know, it was a Moravchik era. And, yeah. Anyway, okay, uh, I'll, I'll try to dissect this. Um, the, the, the first question came from Essie on expertise and values. Are we in the same sort of value circles? I think. You're absolutely right there. Um, we have a tendency to seek confirmation from our, for our basic argumentation. And not only that, nowadays we have the technological instruments, namely algorithms, which do it for us. Whether it's Facebook or Twitter, you know, I block assholes on Twitter uh, because I don't like their opinion or because they're offensive. But that's kind of wrong. Uh, I shouldn't be doing that. Can I give you a book recommendation? Uh, Brett Easton Ellis wrote his first fact book called White. And Brett Easton Ellis was, of course, uh, uh, the author of, uh, what was it, Nightmare? What was it? Huh? American Psycho. Uh, and and it, 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 he's obviously very provocative. 
but his bottom line is, for instance, on, on, on Donald Trump, that we, the liberals, the globalists, the liberal media, get over it. It was a democratic election. Live with it. Don't get offended by everything that is of a different opinion. My big worry is that w w we're losing you know, the, the, the penicillin uh, of diverging uh, opinions. We, we can't tolerate people who are of a different opinion with us. And that's a problem. So yes, I, I, I agree that we do have a problem there. And this means that we're living in a bubbling up world. You and I live in our little EUI or whatever bubble it might be. And then we don't understand what's going on in the rest of the world. And of course that happens in anywhere. You know, I mean, I mentioned Krugman and Stiglitz and you know, these guys, they're old hogs. They, they, they're not gonna you know, change their mind anymore. But I, I think the wonderful thing is if, if, you, if you have a curious mind, you're also able to change your opinion of things. Of course, I'm not trying to say, yeah, let's change and become racist. You know, <laughs> that's not my point. But, but we do have a tendency to, to skew into the same line. But Brett Easton Ellis would be a good read on that. Um, then, sorry, I didn't catch your name. K? K? Kinanya. Ki Kinanya. Kinanya. Uh, you have a very valid question. Should the private sector, you know, because when I was talking about the new world disorder, I, I think that's something that should be done. Uh, you know, in the sense that we should start analyzing that a little bit more. Of course, there's a lot of literature doing it uh, already. Uh, but then we come again to the question of, of representative democracy. Who do these, uh, you know, multi-international uh, companies represent? The big story of Silicon Valley and Facebook and Amazon and, 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 and Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat and I, uh, Apple... Microsoft was that they're liberating the rest of the world. They're here to create the good until we started to understand that actually, you know, data is a pretty fundamental part of who we are and what we do. And the question is, can they self-regulate themselves? My answer to that is no. So that's why you need, you know, in this new world disorder, you need that balance. Now, the big worry that I actually have, and also with finance, you know, that's, we went for regulation. I actually think on finance, regulation doesn't always help. It's penalties that help. So, you know, if, if, if you're a big bank executive and you know that you're going to be 20 years behind bars, then you're probably going to take less risky uh, decisions at the end of the day. My big worry with democracy is, and this is linked to Philip's question about parties, my, my big worry there is that politics is becoming so nasty that sensible people will not go into politics anymore. You know, I'm looking at you all well-educated, thinking people. How many of you would now consider to join a party and, and, and go into politics? And for the cameras, not one hand is raised. One is, two, two, very good, three. Three hands are raised out of a room of you know, 30, 40 uh, people. But the bottom line is that you know, perhaps the path of the private sector is more interesting than the, than the, as a perspective than the public sector. I mean, I, 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 I sort of landed politics by mistake. Uh, I, I'll therefore take Federica's question on emotional and the EU, you know, who, who are they? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess you need to have a, a different conversation. You, we can always talk to our grandparents and say peace, prosperity and security and we never want to have World War II again and hasn't this served you well? But for the younger generation, this seems a rather distant perspective. Nowadays, I think the big story has to be on, on climate change and, and on technology. Uh, and also you need to explain what Europe has brought with it. Uh, and I guess the counterbalance to when you get emotional is that when that is taken away, I mean, we're like babies, when that toy is taken away from you, i.e. Brexit, and you realize no free movement, uh, no free studying, uh, tariffs, uh, you know, these kinds of things, then, then people get emotional about it. So in that sense, it's quite often a negative reaction. In my two kids who have, as I said, dual nationality, uh, when I try to explain, you know, Europe and the European Union to them, they sort of look at me, but, but Dad, you know, that, that's where we live and this is what it is. So when you start taking, it's like love, you know, when you start taking it for granted, that's when you might sort of lose the spark. And, and, and I think a lot of us have started to take the European Union for, for granted. Uh, and, and then when we don't get exactly what we want, then we start blaming someone else and looking for new, uh, new, new sort of solutions. And that's where populism and nationalism comes in. 
And then, Philip, the final question, I think it's quite suitable, that's the final one, is the political parties. Um, I, I myself joined a party only in 2004 uh, in order to run um, for the European uh, Parliament. So I'm not uh, you know, someone who's been born and bred in the political world or in a political party. But as an institution, uh, and I've sometimes also thought that you know, it's, it's not necessarily the most sensible way of doing it, but at the end of the day, you know, it is the glue that sort of keeps us, us together. And, and the, party, the party sort of field is changing fast right now. We're seeing a lot of people becoming you know, one movement uh, parties. And I'm not talking about the Green Party or the AFD or, or whoever. But there seems to be one emotional attachment where you go. And that means that parties sort of emerge and, and rise from nowhere. Of course, throughout history, that's always taken place, but not at the pace at which parties come in now. Um, Finland is a case in point. There always used to be three big parties, two of them in government and one in opposition. Well, now we basically have five big parties. Um, and, and, and one of them, the, the true Finns or the Finns who, who came out of, of, of nowhere. Uh, but I, as much as I, I think party politics sucks, I really don't like it. Uh, you know, I, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's wheeling and dealing and the rest of it. But there is an element of, of continuity there. But now we're getting to a situation, and that's where I think you're right. The, is Donald Trump a Republican? Or do the Republicans support him just because they're afraid not to? You know, I, is, Boris also is Boris conservative, you know, one nation conservative? Or are they, well, not, not many of them support him. <laughs> but I, you know, so, so we, we might be looking at some, but. That, that scares me a bit because then it becomes completely personalized and personification and, and of course when you have, you know, autocracies and tyrants, they, they, tyrannies emerge from a charismatic leader and when it becomes very leader focused rather than party focused, I think then we are, we're in trouble. But that's why I think it's probably one of the most exciting times to be a political scientist right now. <laughs> Well, I think on that note, uh, this was the first event at the Schumann Center for the academic year 2019-20. Uh, I want to thank Alex very, very much for sharing his experience with us, his analytical frames with us. And I want to thank all of you for your active engagement in the subjects. And I'm very struck by the fact you said there were the three blocks. But if you look at the United States and China, these are pretty classical great powers. Uh, and I would also include Russia. It's not a great power any longer, but it's a disruptive power, and the special ops it engages with demonstrate a lot of continuity from the work of the KGB. I don't think, in other words, 1989 was not the end of the story. And so the question is, what kind of power is the EU? And you talked of strategic sovereignty, and by that I understand what you meant was the collective capacity of Europe to be strategic. And that's where the big question is, because on the one hand, if you look at how the EU has responded to the developments in trade, they've been very strategic. Mm. They've gone around the world hoovering up trade deals, both in response to Trump and to Brexit. But if you look at other areas like, uh, like security, defense, then it's so much harder for Europe to be that the, the whole is more than the sum of the parts in, in defense, it's less. Yeah. So it's, it's that unevenness that you find in, in, uh, in the EU. And so the question is, where can it muster that collective strategic capacity from? Uh, interestingly, when it was threatened by Brexit, when it was pretty existential to its future, it mustered it, no problem and maintained unity despite the fact that the United Kingdom should have had an advantage as one state. The United Kingdom should have, as one state, been capable of articulating what it wanted from this process. And what we see is it's entirely incapable of doing that. Whereas the reflex, what was interesting in the EU was its response was set between the 24th of June and the following week, the informal European Council. So it was, it, it, it was, ref, it, it was immediate, and that tells us something uh, about where the EU is at uh, at this stage of its development. You have been a lifelong uh, European, Europeanist, uh, and you have sat in those chambers. 
uh, at many different levels. And it's, it's hard work because this is a continent of deep diversity. It, it's really deep diversity. Uh, and in my view, uh, the continent has no choice but to try to hang together because hanging apart would not be would be uh, would be extremely uh, extremely damaging. So thank you all for coming today and for engaging. Alex, thank you very much for your visit, and we look forward to welcoming you back again. So Thanks. on all your behalf. Thanks.